Um, Tatum's favorite programming language right now is Haskell. Um, but I suspect it's because of there's a, there's a, um, a big blue elephant on the cover of the book and elephant is her favorite animal. So, um, yeah, I'm guessing it's, I'm guessing it's not the, the purity, the functional purity that she's, uh, that she loves it for. Hands off that dial. Business is about to get a whole lot nerdier. You're tuned in to Founder Quest. Yeah, I've just been getting really into scientific uh, visualizations type stuff. So she's she's <laughs> doing R a lot lately. Um, I don't I don't really think it's a very good programming language just for general purpose stuff, but she just seemed to like it. Nice. Yeah. When the Honey Badger founders compete on their kids' language learning, <laughs> oh my kids are doing basic. They suck. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I should, GBM, you should get so. Tatum a PHP book. She would love that. Or Postgres. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> any any like elephant? Why are there so many elephants in programming? By the way, like it's a good question. I don't know. Like yeah. programming books. Is it because of the memory? For Postgres, I think that's the case. Yeah, oh, they, like, they have a long map. They have like a <laughs> yeah. Like they're supposed to be smart or something. Yeah, I don't know. I've never met an elephant like, that struck like, me as that smart. Well, they like suppose like an elephant never forgets, right? So like right. Maybe that means like they, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that doesn't mean they remember. As opposed to Mongo, I guess their logo should be <laughs> what? A fruit fly? Oh, <laughs> oh burn. burn. Sick burn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it dies after 12 hours. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it forgets everything. <laughs> ben, Ben's on fire today. Oh, man. Poor Mongo. I mean, they're, I they're like, <laughs> they've been around, like, it's been like a decade since wow. we've had bad experiences That's with true. Mongo. You know, we're still, we still, I have to say bad <laughs> things about them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, that, yeah. uh, we should probably talk about marketing gentlemen. Sure. Yeah. Um, sounds good. Yeah. Love marketing. So, you love marketing. I do love marketing. I mean, how else, I do too. How else are you going to get people to know about who you are and give you money? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I also hate marketing, but that's another podcast. Commit a crime. Well, I guess, um, but will that convince people to give you money? Well, I mean, they give you yeah, money in the, the end. I mean, I mean, unless the crime well, is like a pun. You end up with money. Is <laughs> yeah. it really that different? <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can convince people through crime. I mean, what what do you think robbery is? <laughs> <laughs> it's an advanced tactic of persuasion. <laughs> We've had like a lot of different. Uh, different marketing strategies. I don't even know strategies, like approaches. We have lots of different marketing approaches over the years. And uh, what's what's like our current, like Josh, you're you're the marketing sort of guru now. You're like the, the person who's <laughs> been most into marketing oh, gosh. recently. So like what's our general sort of approach? I think our approach has always been really centered around content. Like content marketing has always kind of been our big thing. Um, well, I guess content and word of mouth. But I mean like like philosophically, where like where do we do we stand on like what oh. what are the big picture things? Like what do we believe well, about marketing? We believe that that we should, that our marketing should have uh, as much personality as possible. Um, and we should try to be ourselves in our marketing as much as possible. So yeah, I think that's, I don't know, that's the big thing for me. Um, we do different tactics, um, but we're all about, I mean, we're honey badger. We can't like, we can't be all like business professional. So we're like taking our, our weakness, which is our unprofessionalism. <laughs> and we're turning that into a feature. Exactly. And I, I kind of look at it like almost a competitive advantage uh, because, you know, we've got these, we've got these larger competitors with like marketing teams and, and, you know, bosses and things and and they can't get away with the things that we can just as you know scrappy little honey badger or whatever i totally think we can use that to our advantage yeah we can be like the punk rock error tracker fighting the man i know i hate the man so i mean we do content you know we've always done content and stuff but we've also done like a lot of other things right we do the conferences we've done a lot of like uh cool like giveaways and shirts and stuff we do a lot of stuff on you know we do social media stuff Let's talk about conferences. Like when I remember, like what was the first conference we went to? Was it that Rails Conf? Ben and I was was it just uh, I forget when, but we were just talking about when I actually met you, Star. What? Because oh, because we started. If you recall, we started a company together before we had actually met in person. Like we That's were right. legally, we were like legally contract contractually in business together and we had never met each other. Um, so I think I remembered though, that's why I'm bringing this up is I think it was, um, 
what was the um, the Heroku conference in San Francisco? Was I? Yeah. Was was I? Was I? Was I think that was when I first met both of you guys together. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot about that one too. I totally forgot I did too. about that too. Yeah. Oh, so that, that was the that was the first <laughs> I remember now. That was the first meal that Honey Badger paid for. Yeah, it was surreal because I like we'd I'd met Ben before um in person once and when he came down to Portland. But uh I just remember like flying into San Francisco and we're going to this like it was actually like I hadn't been to that many conferences at that point, to be honest, either. So I mean either. And it was one of my first probably first like big conferences I went to and I'm like meeting my business partners for the first time. Yeah, that I met on the internet. And uh, yeah, and we're like, we got our, we have our company credit cards finally. And oh yeah, <laughs> we yeah. can like, so we can excited. like buy ourselves meals. Yeah, that was awesome. yeah. And we stayed, did we all stay in that weird uh, anime Japanese uh -huh. yep. hotel? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, right there yeah. in Japantown. It was awesome. To answer your, that's a long way to answer your question is I think that was the first conference that we all went to. And you know what, <laughs> yeah. man? Uh, the That conference still sticks out in my mind as like the most fun conference I've ever been to. Well, from, I mean, like from this, what we're talking about right now, um, from like the, the whole personality and marketing thing, like Waza was like... The, I, I think I feel like Heroku always did a great job with with that aspect of marketing. Like that conference, we remember that conference because it was so unique. I think, and yeah, because it was true. so different. So to bring it back around, like that's kind of that's kind of what I'm talking about. Is um, like yeah, like whatever, seven, six, seven years later, we're still talking about it. Yeah. So Heroku is like an application hosting company, right? And now they're owned by Salesforce, but they used to be like a startup and everything. And they, uh, I mean, they're called Heroku. They have this sort of Japanese thing. I guess Heroku is a Japanese word. I think so. I don't, I don't know Japanese, so I don't know what it means. It means something in Japanese. I Maybe, maybe yeah. it just sounds Japanese. Matt's probably knows. But their whole, uh, yeah, all their marketing was very different, right? It was very sort of like Zen, Japanese garden type, beautiful minimalist feel to it. And this conference also had a very, a very unique feel to it. Like it, it felt like almost an, an art event. As yeah, much it was all about like, like crafting, like crafting things, I th as if I remember correctly. So yeah, like they had these, th these people come out and do this weird, I, it was like some sort of dance where they were like ceremonially, like sweeping the floor of the, like the stage where the presenters were going to be. <laughs> it wasn't like a normal conference venue where you're just sort of in, you know, there's there's a hallway, there's a bunch of rooms. It's kind of like a, a hotel or whatever. It was this, this beautiful open space. Like the whole conference was in this giant open room. And there were these little stations where you could go and like do, uh, like you can make robots and things. Yeah, it was just super unique. And I was I was sad that they stopped doing that because I really wanted to go back the following year, but it was, it was over. Yeah. Yeah, it was just two years. Yeah, we went that 2013. Yeah, I think, you know, our earliest marketing efforts like going to that conference was having Honey Badger logo on our shirts, right? And just walking oh, yeah. around and people be like, oh, what's Honey Badger, right? And uh, I, I picked that trick up from uh, my Rails Kits days when I would wear mm -hmm. the Rails Kits shirt to RailsConf and people were like, oh yeah, Rails Kits. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. yeah. Nice. Works. Yeah. yeah. We also no, I, I actually, I remember, I remember you like telling us that story when we actually wore the shirts. Oh yeah. Well, I wasn't listening. <laughs> so that's, the other thing we did, fun. the other thing that we did, um, so shortly after, after Waza, we went to, uh, I think there was, we went to RailsConf and it was in Portland only, you know, as a company, we didn't have enough money to buy tickets to RailsConf yeah. because we weren't making any money whatsoever. Um, just getting us to Portland was, you know, a big enough expense for us. So we basically went to RailsConf and just sort of like hung out in the hallway. Yeah. We just crashed the lobby. Yeah. And do we have, have like stickers printed up? And stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. We had stickers printed up. We were like scattering them around, like you do, <laughs> leaving them in restrooms. Uh huh. Uh, and it was very Portland of us in in hindsight. Like, so GitHub did this after party because this this was back when like GitHub was actually doing you know sponsoring big things at uh, conferences involving mm -hmm. Ruby. They don't really do that anymore, as far as I know. GitHub had this sort of after party thing where they uh, they bought out ground control like ground control is this sort of famous arcade with tons of pinball tons of retro games and stuff in portland and they're just like okay nerds free play so i'm like well i i don't have like a conference badge or anything but i want to get on, on that so i just kind of like went in and slipped through did you guys go with me or did i go by myself i, I think you i don't think i went that time okay yeah we've been to ground control but i don't yeah i don't think that i went to that one 
Yeah. So anyway, so this was my own <laughs> stealth mission. So I <laughs> snuck in amongst like a pack of nerds. Yeah. And that's when I learned that I really like pinball because previously, you know, whenever I try and play pinball, you put in a quarter and if you don't know how to play, you just like immediately lose. And it's, it's that's frustrating. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, with free play, you can play as much as you want. So I just played pinball for a while. And I actually got us a customer then too, because uh, there was a, a company called Sorcery. Uh, a whole pack of developers came in and I was like, hey, what's up? What's Sorcery? And they told me it was like some sort of uh, uh, like logistics thing. And, you know, I told them about uh, my deal and I told them about Honey Badger. And that was back when everybody was super excited to find any sort of air tracker that was an, an alternative to air brake. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and then later on they signed up. So well, nice. I don't yeah. know if I, I don't, I don't think I knew this story. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. To me. Well, I think that may be, uh, that's definitely my first direct uh, getting people to sign up event. Yeah. So I, this reminds me of like, we kind of internally, um, kind of jokingly, but I mean, it's an, it's an actual term is we refer to our marketing as like guerrilla marketing. And I like, that is like the, the pinnacle of guerrilla marketing to me is like sneaking into a conference event that <laughs> you, you didn't even pay for. And then, and then selling someone your product. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I guess that is pretty badass. And yeah, <laughs> that's pretty badass uh-huh. or, or annoying. <laughs> yeah, well, on the, so you do it. we can talk about guerrilla marketing, but yeah, you need to, it, it should be done with tact yeah. obviously, but yeah. Uh, yeah, 2014, we, we picked it up a notch, right? We we went and spoke at like 5,000 different conferences. I remember Star, mm-hmm. you put together like 20 proposals and you shotgunned every conference. I did. Uh, I submitted like, yeah, like yeah, 10 yeah. or 15 proposals to every single <laughs> Ruby conference. And, and at the time, mm-hmm. there, were like, there were like 15 Ruby conferences. Yeah. yeah. We were all over the place that year. Remember, mm-hmm. you guys yeah. like spent, yeah, that, that was like your all you were doing for for a while it seemed because that you know at the time that was just like people just wanted to hear that there was an alternative to air brake mm-hmm. uh, so going out and being amongst amongst the people uh was was totally a good thing i'm trying to so, remember yeah. how many i actually attended that year because i know like i it was at least one one a month probably and i know there were a few months where there were like multiple conferences yeah. um per month so yeah i would i would say like 10 12 conferences probably Oh man. And if nothing else, like I made a ton of, of like people who actually turned out to be good friends now, like, like a lot Mm -hmm. of my friend group in Seattle comes directly from uh, just going to conferences and not even conferences in Seattle. Uh, cause a lot of Seattle folks go to other, you know, towns and do conferences, especially, you know, when the whole Ruby conference circuit was on fire. I met, uh, you know, Richard Bishop, um, who lives in Seattle now and, and works for Amazon. Um, I met him at, I think it was ancient city Ruby in, uh, in Florida. And that was, I want to say that was 2014, 2015. So that was around our, our big like conference travel time, but he, yeah, he didn't live, he didn't live in Seattle at the time. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I met my good friend, Carrie, um, mm-hmm. who, I, I think I met her at uh, maybe Philadelphia or maybe Pittsburgh. I don't yeah. know. I met my good friend Jeremy at Pittsburgh. Uh, he, you know, had just moved to Seattle, and uh, I ended up sort of in a D and D game with like both of them, and so I got to know them really well. Uh, this was, you know, all after the conference, a couple of years. But man, it takes a toll on you, doesn't it? Oh gosh, yeah. That was a rough year. Um, yeah, yeah. But it built a lot of awareness, right? A lot of people learned about who we were. You know, and that we existed just mm-hmm. because there was someone up on stage, you know, that had our logo in the slide deck, right? And and also made a lot of great connections uh, with people, you know, the friends like you're talking about, but also people who like found out, hey, this this honey badger thing, like there are actual people behind it, right? It's not some nameless yeah. company that just is off doing its thing. It's like these are real people who are kind of cool, and I, I like them, and so I think that really helped make a connection with people and help build the brand individually. Oh, totally. Because like, just like you said, Josh, like our big thing is um, we're devs like, like you are, you know, we're building a product for you because we want to make your lives easier. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, if if you're in a, like we were, if you're in a position where you're competing with someone who's already in the space or maybe has more backing than you do, you know, that's something that they're not necessarily going to do, right? The IBMs of the world are not going to be sitting out there hanging out with people around the table at lunch. Uh, at the developer conference. But when you're a startup, you can do stuff like that. So one thing I did uh, that I probably should have done a little bit differently, um, but my my whole um, 
outlook on how I should present myself when we first started going to conferences, I was like, well, I'm going to this professional thing. I need to look at least somewhat professional. Um, and I, I got to tell you guys, like I've always had a love of like blazers and I never get to wear them because like I work at home. I'm not going to put on a nice shirt and a blazer to work at home. So I was like, okay, conferences, this is going to be my time where I get to let my blazer game shine. You know, I'm not really sure it worked very well because like I would go and sit down at the conference lunch and start talking <laughs> to people and everyone kept asking me, so are you a recruiter? Yeah. Like what's going on <laughs> well, with they, you? Yeah, they, like they probably thought you were in sales or something. Or, I yeah. know, I know. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, come on. Like it's, it's a blazer. You can put it one on too. It's your, it your problem is like you, you should have had some sort of like pin or patch or something on the blazer to like distinguish yourself as a developer, uh, like a logo of a programming language or something, maybe like a Haskell or something. So then people think I'm really smart or, or yeah, maybe just, maybe just like the Lambda character. Oh, that's a good one. We didn't maintain that forever, right? After 2014, we, we did a few more, but we decided like we weren't going to be out there hitting the road every year. Uh, yeah. And then also the Ruby conferences diminished, the number of them diminished. But they are yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, because there's still like way more Ruby conferences than I think any other language that, you know, I've, I've heard of, but the, the total number has gone down quite a bit. And also I noticed a lot of companies have sort of stopped sponsoring conferences as much so like um so github used to do these crazy like after parties they used to do parties they used to buy out ground control stop doing that well i think like um, github in particular has grown so i mean like there's they're a household i mean they were a kind of household name back then but i mean now that you know like they were acquired by microsoft they're like they're just i mean they're github well yeah and but i feel well i i feel like um a lot like a lot of those companies i at least my impression has been that they're there really to like to get their name out and higher versus, you know, like getting customers, at least that's, that's kind of what I thought. Um, I know there's, there were some companies that there were, were there as a product, but um, I think there's a, also a lot of companies there that are like looking to hire. But I mean, okay. Think of our, think of our uh, like sort of direct competitors. Our direct competitors used yeah. to sponsor a lot of conferences and mm -hmm. that's definitely sort of cut back. Like they, there used yeah. to be like all of them almost at RailsConf and right. now, I mean, I don't yeah, think I there saw were, any of the last um, Rails comp I went. Yeah, Sentry I, does. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see any booths or anything. Uh, I didn't see a Sentry booth. I there, yeah, there, there, there. You're right. They, they, maybe I missed it. Our competitors have like there were decisions. I, I happen to know there was like specific decisions made to like cut back on the conference, um, conference uh, sponsorships, just because I, I don't think that they were as effective as before. Yeah, and I don't know why. Like, I mean, that's that's specifically to error trackers too. Um, at least that's what I know. That's what my experience is in. But maybe it's because like as the industry has matured, people kind of already have their error tracker now. Like, I don't. I'm not. That's just kind of a speculation. Yeah, I wonder. Like, maybe you know, before like when we were kind of just moving off of like like error tracking had been like there was air break and maybe a few others, but like it was still kind of a newish like a newish thing. And now the it's so saturated that. You know, I don't know if it's as effective to like go and get new customers. Yeah, I think we we experienced that ourselves, you know, and we decided to trim back the number of sponsorships that we did because of that. Like, you know, once once you get enough awareness going, once that flywheel is spinning fast enough, you don't need to keep investing in that particular method anymore. I think uh, I don't know. It was I think for us like the real value to us was brand awareness right. and when um you know like people we go to conferences today and pe like most people know who honey badger is yeah um at, at a ruby conference it and makes conferences yeah. more fun because you, well, you yeah. help people it does <laughs> but, um, and, but yeah you know, kind of... but if if no one knows who you are like going to conferences is like i mean that's like you even today like if i was building something new i would i would hit the conference circuit again you know to get get that brand out there and yeah and get in front of people because once they already know who you are then conferences might not be as effective. So I imagine that people who are listening to this are trying to maybe apply this to their own situation. And I wonder, uh, like, I kind of think that maybe we got lucky just because we happen to be in a field and uh, we have a product for people who just freaking love to conference. I've never seen a group of people that like gets together and does uh, events like Ruby people do. 
Yeah. Yeah. The Ruby, the Ruby circuit is, is kind of, it, it is interesting, especially if you go to like, when we went, when we spent a year basically going to all of them, you kind of get to know all the circuit people too. Yeah. That's it. It's like this weird, like, yeah. Traveling tribe that you're it's like you're part of. It, it, <laughs> yeah. It's like cart, <laughs> like carnies. <laughs> that year when we were going to so many conferences, I would basically just stop going to the talks because I had literally heard the same talk like several <laughs> times at several yeah. different conferences. Well, we gave we, we gave the same talk at several different conferences. Well, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm not well, blaming them. It yeah, takes yeah. a lot of time to make a talk. Yeah. So that so we, here's a pro tip for future conference <laughs> uh, speakers: if you're trying to uh, if you're trying to uh, raise your profile, speak at more conferences, don't do what I did and make 15 different uh, <laughs> proposals. Because let me tell you, when you make 15 different proposals, that means that if you get accepted by five conferences, great, you've got five speaking engagements, whatever but you've got to make five completely separate slide decks. And that takes a ton of time. Yeah, that sounds like so much work. Like it would take me a couple of weeks of more or less full-time work to put together a presentation for someplace like RailsConf. That's not even like a perfect presentation. <laughs> like that's just sort of what I, I thought was like an acceptable presentation. It worked. Like, yeah, that's true. That's also me. I, I tend to over prepare for things. So, well, it seems like, I mean, it seems like a good strategy though would be like, since it does take, you put so much work into a talk. Um, if like, if you're going to put, if you're going to put together five talks, why not just like spend that time or even half that time putting together one really, really good talk. Yeah. And then giving it at a bunch of places around the country, because there's, it's not the same people going to those conferences, um, except for the, you know, the people, the circuit people. So totally. everyone can benefit by it. The only gotcha is that it's really kind of hard to tell which talks are going to take off. Like a lot of times the proposals that got accepted of mine were not the ones that I expected to get accepted. Sometimes they were just ones that I was just like, well, I'm just going to throw this out here because I kind of know about it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's really a numbers game. And I think, you know, the reason why you had so many opportunities to speak was because you did 10 or 15. Right. And so yeah. there was plenty of selection and yeah, just a lot of numbers worked in your favor. I guess there's no perfect uh, approach. No, it's all an experiment. So um, our our conference uh, our conference strategy now we we do some conferences, but it's it's changed a little bit. And I thought maybe we could talk about that just um, because we're we're not really going to conferences for the same reason these days. But I think it's a chance. I mean, it's a chance to go and talk to new people and meet new people for sure. But it's also a chance to kind of reconnect with the people that we've met and reconnect, with, especially with our customers. It's it's really cool. I love going to conferences. And and meeting our customers, some of them who have been customers for years. Oh, totally. Are we going to yeah. talk about food? So I think we should talk about food because this is, well, this is talk. our main. This is our main marketing secret. I'm going to just out <laughs> us right now. So it's not I, for me. It's not necessarily food. Um, it's it's more of like experiences. But I mean, food is like my favorite experience. So it usually <laughs> <laughs> it, it usually is a food event that uh, that we'll plan. Um, and I, I know Ben Ben kind of like was one did one of these the first of these um which is really kind of like like creating like a unique event for people at the conference to go to because a lot of people are looking for something to do and they might not know people and it's nice to like have something interesting and unique to go to that doesn't feel like it's going to be um some sort of cocktail hour or something where you're just like standing around and not really knowing who to talk to and that sort of thing so what we've done is uh i think ben you uh what, was it in kansas city that we did um we did a it was a, a a barbecue tour yeah that was that was fun so how did that work we when we were going to kansas city there was uh, a number of activities happening and we signed up to sponsor one of them basically and the one that we sponsored was the uh, barbecue tour bus, which was just awesome. Like I had no idea, but you know, people living in Kansas City know that uh, barbecue is a thing there. So we uh, signed up to sponsor this tour bus, which loads up. I don't remember how many people it was thirty or forty people. Load them up onto a bus and take them on a tour of Kansas City, some of the historical districts, and stop at a couple of different barbecue places to have a couple of uh, light meals. And it was just a ton of fun. Like I, I just put out a thing ahead of time saying, hey, the first 30 people who sign up get to come and, and hang out on the bus and, and have some barbecue with us. And uh, we got there, uh, I think it was like the night, the first night uh, before the conference actually started. 
you know, everyone who showed up and was on the list piled into the bus. We drove around and had some food and, and, and chatted. And Josh, like you said, like I had a couple of people there who were like, yeah, we've been customers for a long time. And it was pretty, yeah. pretty fun to meet, meet them. And uh-huh. of course, there were some people who didn't know who we were. And they're just like, hey, free food. I'm down for that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it was, it was great. So getting to meet a lot of people and not, like you said, not having this cocktail hour thing where you're having to yell at people to, to hear them, but you're just sitting down and talking with two or three people on the bus and yeah. across from someone at dinner. It was a lot of fun. Well, and I think the the key for me, I think, is that you're ex- you're sharing an experience too. Like this is something like, like everyone goes to like whatever the conference after party, but not everyone can get on the bus, and not everyone can go on this tour that is a shared experience of like you're you know you're going somewhere. Um, and it there, there's been other instances where where conferences like it's rare that they do they're they're this good, but um, I think it was that again ancient city Ruby. Um, one of like their events were all like. Um, like they didn't do as many, like so many parties, like they did more, um, like they had a number of tours and things that, that people could get together, like sign up for basically, and then go do them. So we did like the, um, Ripley's believe it or not, there's a ghost tour in ancient city, um, because it's like the oldest city in America. Um, so yeah, that was the one I went to creating a shared experience with other conference goers where it's not just all about networking, even though networking happens, but it's, it's about doing something else. I think that kind of takes a lot of the social pressure off of the situation. Since then, um, since the barbecue bus, I think we've kind of doubled down on that, on that idea. It's not even like if a conference is not offering that kind of event, like that doesn't mean you can't just go and do it yourself, which is what we did in Phoenix. Um, so I did, a, I did another bus and we went, we took a group to, uh, to In-N-Out Burger because In-N-Out Burger happens to have a location in Phoenix and it's like not within walking distance of the conference. So this was for RailsConf, right? Yeah. So that was RailsConf, I think, in Phoenix. We were not sponsors of RailsConf. We were not sponsors of RailsConf. No, because RailsConf is crazy expensive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's like... 15 to 30 grand or something. Yeah. But even though you don't sponsor a conference, like there's nothing saying that you can't uh, say charter a bus and park it outside the convention center and then tweet at people <laughs> to say, hey, if exactly. you want some, if you want to go like, to in and out uh, yeah, just get on board that little bus there. Uh-huh. Um, don't worry about who's taking you. <laughs> this is the this is this is guerrilla marketing. I mean, like, yeah, you can you can do you can do whatever you want. Like you're not like I said, you have to have tact. Like you're not gonna like yeah. I'm not like parking the bus outside of the main event. You're not rushing the stage during the keynote and be like hey. Yeah, uh, but I mean mm-hmm. like you're taking you're taking a group of fifty friends out for dinner. I right? mean <laughs> like <laughs> what's wrong with what's wrong with that, right? Yeah, I don't think like I like. You s- it sounds like you're a little bit defensive about it almost, but I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Like if I no. was a conference organizer, I would love it if people were just creating these more rich experiences happening after the conference. Like that, that yeah. would be awesome because to, I mean, conference organizers can't uh, ensure that everybody has a great time all the time after mm-hmm. the conference. Yeah. And it, and like, it makes the conference better. It totally does. And uh, like, this was, this was a couple years ago at this point, we, I still like people I meet that, you know, there are people that I catch up with that were on the bus. Like they still bring it up when, when I meet them at conferences now. So it's like something people are still talking about. Um, uh, Mike Parham uh, has like for years done a, uh, a game night at like, every Ruby, I think Ruby and rails conf. That's another great example. Um, it's it's marketing for for his project Sidekick. I'm sorry, I just had I just had a genius idea. Um, if we ever do a bus again, uh huh, which we I, we we are. So I need I need your ideas. Okay, we can have some T-shirts printed up that say, "Were you on the bus?" <laughs> 2019. I love it. I yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I did. Um, so I don't know if I ever told you guys like on the actual bus that I chartered. I actually had like I went I actually paid for everyone's dinner which by the way is like 750 a person so we we spent like 2 or 300 bucks on dinner for like a bus of people which is just I mean you it doesn't get cheaper than that for a conference sponsorship How much did the bus um, cost too like what was the our bus total was, the bus was like 2 or 300 bucks I think uh, maybe it was 4 but like we were we were well under like probably $700 for the whole oh thing Oh my goodness um, <laughs> so it makes a lot of sense in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but yeah, like I, uh, I had brought shirts, so I put a shirt, like a nicely folded shirt on each seat. Um, I had a little envelope because I didn't like in and out is just kind of like, you know, walk up to the line and, and order. So, um, I didn't know how to pay for everyone. So I just went to a bank and, um, and got a bunch of $10 bills, uh-huh. like took out, took out a bunch of $10 bills put, you know, got, I bought some envelopes at like a, like a CVS or something. And I put, so I put a sticker and a $10 bill in each envelope 
put it on top of the shirt. And so like you walk onto the bus, you find a seat, your seat has your stuff on it. Um, and that, yeah. And then we just drive it in and out and had a good time. Those kind of events are fantastic. You know, I, I enjoy them. Uh, but your, your comment, your comment about putting things on the seat reminded me like the <laughs> untactful things that you can do for sponsoring conferences. Like when you're not really sponsoring, like, you know, I've seen people like try to sneak in the main hall and put their stickers on chairs, right? Before yeah. Keynote. That's not cool. That's, that's, that's not cool. Don't, right? don't do that. Because the sponsors, the real sponsors are actually paying for that privilege, right? They, yeah. they, they do pay f- quite a bit of money to have the, the right to put something in the, those drop bags or on those chairs. You know, uh, most conferences that we go to anyway have a like a, a sticker sharing station, right? Where you're expected to just dump off a load of stickers if you want to share them, right? And people can come by and pick them up. That's totally cool. Yeah. But, but do respect the the conference organizers. You know, have bills to pay, and the sponsorships pay those bills, and uh, you know, right. those sponsorships come with those privileges. I think a good like for me, I think the line is like if if people are obligated to be there as a result of like attending the conference, then if you're not a sponsor, then don't interfere yeah. with them. Like you have to go to the conference hall in order to go and see the talk. So like don't go put stuff on their seats because the sponsors are yeah, the sponsors are there for that. But if you invite them to something off whatever, off duty and and they respond and they just want to be there, <laughs> then then it's totally fine. For every conference, there's this group of people that they're together at the conference, but they're also they're also together on Twitter. They're also together, you know, in whatever conference, you know, communication system there is, like the conference, uh, like MicroConf had a conference Slack. So yeah, I mean, we did something similar just by launching this podcast during MicroConf. And we didn't go to MicroConf and sponsor it. We didn't set up a like booth in the hallway of, of MicroConf, but we did, we were like, hey, uh, MicroConf people, we're here at MicroConf and we're launching our podcast. Please check it out. Yeah. Uh, which I think that's a respectful way to do things. Sure. Mm-hmm. Especially when the conference is a bunch of entrepreneurs who are... Oh yeah. Them, right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, yeah, people would be way more pushy than we are. (laughs) That's the problem with being a developer is that your conscience prevents you from like doing the really aggressive marketing stuff. Well, there is, um, we've talked about the honey badger suit and (laughs) we, we have our, uh, our marketing, uh, director, Ben Finley has, has graciously volunteered to wear a honey, a honey badger suit. Is there a honey badger suit? Do we have one? It doesn't exist yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I doubt it actually exists in the world because honey badgers are are really ugly. So I don't know who would want to wear one besides us, but yeah, if Ben has volunteered to, uh, to wear one, if we make one. (laughs) So talking about honey badgers, uh, one thing that I think has been really cool for us has been our amazing swag. I feel like we do swag marketing way better than any of our competitors, mm-hmm. better than most companies. Um, and that's just because like our namesake, Honey Badger, we don't, you know, give a, a F. Can I say, yeah. I, don't, I think you this can is a family podcast. You can, you can say yeah. whatever you want. I don't want to well, get the explicit label on, on iTunes. Okay, oh, well, yeah. That's a that's a good reason. I mean, like I you say you you say whatever you want, but yeah, if, if you don't like, care. So uh, we got um, when did we start doing this? Like four or five years ago, we got a great the artist. shirts. Yeah, yeah. We got yeah. Kyle Schold, my friend Kyle Schold, who's a local uh, artist here in the Pacific Northwest, who's great, um, and uh, he designed our shirts and uh, and yeah, they're kind of like comic book, uh, like graphic novel style, like badass honey badgers. Yeah, um, he's the same guy destroying who did the podcast work. Yeah. Yeah. He did the, yeah, did our podcast artwork. So it's kind of nice. Like, yeah. I like how every couple of years we get a new set done and there's always like a new, uh, it's always a new little story. Like for a while, um, we had these shirts where the honey badger was like fighting a giant bug at one, like a bug was like destroying a train or something because like his rails. It was, yeah, it was like a Ruby train on rails. It, it had a whole thing. Like it, it probably went a little too deep for like a, <laughs> like a, like a three by three sticker. <laughs> so I learned a lesson there, but, um, <laughs> what the, the most recent one, uh, which I, uh, art directed, um, had, uh, the honey badger, like on top of a building, like King Kong. Yeah. That's our and, current shirt. Yeah. That's the current one. Yeah. I mean, we could probably go back and reprint some of those though. Cause people's, people's old ones are probably wearing out by now. Uh, totally. You know, yeah. The, the limited edition though. That's a thing. Like people and people yeah. are, collect them all. Right. Well, I'm a, I'm, I, what I'd like to do is I, eventually I'd like to try doing it like a swag store where we could, we could put some of our older shirts up for sale or put all of our shirts up for sale. Cause I mean, they're good shirts. Yeah. I mean, like we give them out right now kind of as, um, because since we don't like do we're not like taking boxes of them to conferences anymore like we have people who ask us for them and we use a company um, called printfection to do this 
Yeah. And before we had Perfection, we were, uh, th- <laughs> we're not sponsored by Perfection. I'm just going to say their name a lot. <laughs> so before we had that, we would basically go to a local um, screen printer, have a giant box of shirts made up, go to a, a sticker maker, have a giant box of stickers made up. Josh and I at various points had these like in our closets or garages or whatever. Mm-hmm. And whenever we needed a shirt, we would pack it up and mail it out. Or yeah. if we're, if we're going taking, if we're sponsoring a conference, um, I don't know about you, but I remember lugging like boxes of like 75 shirts across the country. Yeah. Like um, you check them. One time <laughs> in Pittsburgh, I actually like forgot the box at check because I don't check a bag normally. And I got all, I, the like the Pittsburgh, like where the conference was, is like 30 minutes from the airport. Oh my goodness. Traffic. And I get, I got to the hotel and realized I hadn't, hadn't oh my remembered goodness. my I had box. No idea. Yeah. I, I had didn't know about that. <laughs> so I'm, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Printfection. <laughs> yeah. So what Printfection does is they um, they print up your shirts and they keep them in their warehouse. And when somebody wants a shirt, um, you give them a link to a form and they fill out the form with their size info and with you know their address and it gets mailed to them. And you as the business owner don't have to do any of that BS because that is... Man, let me tell you, uh, like most screen printing companies don't even fold the shirts for you. Like, how do you create a nicely folded, like, t-shirt presentation that's your swag? I don't know. Like, I've just, at times, I've had, like, we, we sponsor a conference, and I've had just a pile of unfolded t-shirts out because, like, what else am I, can I do in the moment? Yeah. I actually, my wife, um, Kaylin, graciously helped me fold the shirts on a number of occasions before going to a conference because I just didn't, I, I would have had a pile of shirts on a table. I know. Like, <laughs> and, I've, and, uh, and I don't like, know how I've, to fold. So I folded a lot of them. I actually bought a shirt folder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's, right. see, that's, I should have been that smart. Um, yeah. Cause I can fold shirts, but you should see what they look like. <laughs> yeah. They don't look nice. Like <laughs> to fold a shirt in a like presentable professional way is really yeah. more difficult than you might think. Yeah. Kaylin worked, uh, she had some retail jobs, um, in her earlier days. And so like, she knows how to fold a shirt properly and it was, yeah, I was thankful. So yeah, we've outsourced a fair amount, like a lot of labor to them, and it's it's worth it's worth whatever we pay for them. It's it's a bit it's a bit spendy, but worth it, I think. Yeah, they also do a great thing where if you are sponsoring a conference and you do want a box of shirts, you can just have them do all the folding, box it up, and send it to the hotel where you're going to be staying. So you don't have to lug yeah. it to the airport, right? And then you just bring it to the to the conference it's awesome yeah even that though is is difficult sometimes because let me tell you a box of 70 shirts is heavier than you might think and it's also big and it's not the sort of thing that's easy for one man to carry around well and you got and you have to do if you don't give them all away you have to do something with them too yeah um which is which is one of the problems i ran into and uh yeah actually like a couple times um at i think it was at ruby comps when, when, uh, cause Mike, Mike, uh, Param, who I mentioned before that does the game night for sidekick, um, it was in the same boat. Like he's lugging shirts to conferences too. And we would both have shirts. Um, like we would sometimes both have shirts left over at the conference. So we started, uh, actually like at the very end, like when, when people would be leaving, like, or like when sponsors would be packing up early and stuff, we would like, like we had a thing where we would, uh, would like, uh, hijack a table like an empty table and then just put out like a tweet, like, you know, like a, whatever, a tweet storm or something, um, like come in, you know, come to table, this table at this location uh, uh, at this time and, and, you know, take a shirt because they're, they all have to go. <laughs> That's amazing. Maybe, uh, maybe conference organizers should partner with local charities like Goodwill and tell them, Hey, our conference is going to end at this place at this time. And there will be shirts that you can just come and take. Ah, well, marketing. I'm glad we were able to cover um, the entirety of the subject. <laughs> yeah, I think we did. Um, we could maybe break this up into two podcasts. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe next time we can talk about specific acquisition activities that we did in the early, early days. Because even before yeah. the conferences, you know, what did we do to get those first customers? Oh, yeah. yeah. There's so much. I mean, like... There's a lot. We could, yeah, we could, like, go deep on some of these marketing issues because there's yeah. so much. There's so much to cover. And, I mean, personally, I mean, we, we code a lot, but I think marketing is, like, our number one activity that we all do on an ongoing basis and spend a lot of time on it. And it's oh, not... Totally. Yeah, and it's, it's like... It's not like, you know, like quote marketing, um, at least for me, like it's, it's really just about like connecting with people and, um, 
yeah and like showing the, our personality to the world and and all of that so that's the part i like about it anyway of course it does help to have a really killer product it does yeah you kind of have to write a little code for that <laughs> all right well we can uh yeah we can definitely do some more um, podcasts on this this big topic of marketing well, it was great talking to you guys likewise yeah you too always fun. Yeah, we'll catch you on the flip side bye later i'm working on a, a phrase <laughs> catch you gotta, on the flip side gotta, gotta catch your <laughs> na- nail your catchphrase there yeah. yeah cool okay bye later ThunderQuest is a weekly podcast by the founders of honey badger zero instrumentation 360 degree coverage of errors outages and service degradations for your web apps if you have a web app you need it available at honeybadger.io Want more from the founders? Go to founderquestpodcast.com. That's one word. You can access our huge back catalog or sign up for our newsletter to get exclusive VIP content. FounderQuest is available on iTunes, Spotify, and other purveyors of fine podcasts. We'll see you next week.